It's going to be funny because the people watching us live tonight are going to be looking at these jelly fish. Thank you. Have you ever preached a sermon when someone just looked at you like this the whole time? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's my goal. Yeah. So, you're all just staring at your nose and it's like this. Better you lose your glasses and it'll drop your own head. If I have glasses, it'll be you like that. Are you live? Or is he live? Are you live? We are live. He's on there. We are on there. All right, folks, let's go to Lord in prayer tonight. Father, we just thank you for tonight. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for, once again, the opportunity. Lord God, to gather in this place, Lord God, to lift up the name of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Father, I thank you that we live in such a strategic time and a strategic hour. Lord God, and you called us and you've entrusted to this, Lord God. But Father, your word says to, uh, to be ready to give an answer to any man that would ask for that reason, that hope that's within you. And Father, we know that the only way that we can give that answer is if we uh, study to show ourselves approved unto God so we can rightly divide that word of truth. That way we don't have to be working and are ashamed. So tonight as we come into this place, Lord God, Father, we want you to equip us, Lord God, for the work of the ministry, Lord God, and that's to bring people into your kingdom. And Father, we know tonight there's only one way into your kingdom, and that's through faith and the finished work of the cross of Calvary. So as we gather in this place, Father, we need your heart. We need your mind, Lord God. So Father, every distraction, anything, Lord God, that would impede, Lord God, you speaking to us, that you might speak through us, Lord God, we cast those things down. Every imagination, any thought, anything that would exalt itself against your knowledge, Lord God, we take those things captive, Lord God, to the obedience of Christ. And tonight, we punish past disobedience, Lord God, with obedience today. We're asking, Lord God, to cleanse us, to search us, Lord God, to remove anything, Lord God, that would be a hindrance, Lord God, to your will, to your spirit in our life, Lord God. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, guys, we're going to dive into uh, uh, Galatians chapter 2. Uh, once again, good to have you guys. Appreciate your uh, willingness to come out early. For this class, if you're watching live, uh, obviously we're about an hour earlier than what you're expecting, but we'll be here on Wednesdays at the same time. And we'll be broadcasting live right from my Facebook page as well. So we appreciate you diving into our Galatians. If you've not been with us in the past and uh, you have a desire to catch up on that, you can go to the Cross Life Fellowship uh, YouTube channel, I guess it is, and just place that in and you're going to see all the preceding uh, uh, classes there as well. So Galatians chapter uh, 2. Oh, sure, we've been talking about this. 21 verses, uh, 1 through 10, make up a time of preparation necessary to extend that covenant to the Gentiles in 11 through 21 those verses make up the confrontation necessary to defend the basis of the new covenant so what I want to do tonight is just start out we want to read those first 10 verses that we began looking at last week and so Galatians chapter 2 you have your Bibles uh, beginning with verse 1 it says then 14 years later remember this is Paul the Apostle he had addressed the issue that he, uh, previously he had gone to uh, Jerusalem met with Peter privately just Peter and just uh, kind of casually with James. Didn't get into a whole lot of stuff. Now, 14 years later, he's showing back up at Jerusalem. He said, so I went to Jerusalem again. He said, this time I came with Barnabas, and Titus came along with me too. He said, I went there because God revealed to me that I should go. He said, while I was there, I met privately with those considered to be leaders of the church, and I shared with them the message that I had been preaching to the Gentiles. This next part, whatever, whatever translation you're reading, whatever it reads in yours, he said, I wanted to make sure that they were in agreement. Note that in your Bible. Paul went to make sure that they were in agreement. You'll know why I kind of uh, uh, really make that point just here in a second. He says, so for fear that all of my efforts had been wasted, and I was running the race for nothing. And he said, and they supported me. Write that too. They supported him. He went to make sure they were in agreement, and they supported him. And they did not even demand that his companion Titus be circumcised, though he was a, a Gentile. I want to give you a key tonight. When we're looking at Galatians chapter 2, and really the whole effort that Paul was making to make sure that these Judaizers didn't come in. And the key in relationship to the Word, in, to relationship to the, uh, in regards to any nature of, of, of something built relationally upon God or man, and it's verse 2. He said, I want to make sure that we're in agreement. He went for what reason? To make sure that they were in agreement. No agreeing to disagree. And I touched on this last week. The gospel message is not a message that we agree to disagree on. There are certain things that we've got to stand pat on. There are certain things that, that, that we can't deviate from. Uh, because we know that the Word tells us in the last days that many will depart from the faith. And they'll give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So if they're going to depart from the doctrines of Christ, we know from 2 Timothy chapter 4, the time's coming when men will not endure 
sound doctrine, but after their own lust, their own desires, they're going to gather to themselves teachers because they have itching ears. They're going to turn their ears away from truth, and they're going to turn to fables. They're going to turn to something that's erroneous, or as the Word says, they're going to depart from the faith, and they're going to give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. But the only way we can avoid that, and not just them 2,000 years ago at the church in Galatia, but the only way we can avoid that is if we stop agreeing to disagree. I mean, Jesus Christ is who? He's the Son of the living God. He was born of a virgin. He died on the cross for the redemption of man's sins. He rose from the dead after three days. He's going to come back for a church, not a church that's religious, but a church that's righteous. He died to set us free from sin. I mean, there's certain things that we've got to agree on. We can't just say to ourselves, as long as we're nice people, as long as we give enough money to the United Way, that, that all roads lead to Rome, as long as somebody's sincere in their faith. Folks, listen, when people tell you and you're talking to somebody and say, well, the problem with Christians is, is they think they're right. Well, that's what makes us Christians. Because if we weren't Christians, we would be wrong like everyone else. Christ is the righteousness of God revealed. So we're right in so much as we hold to the teachings of Christ Jesus. And we don't have to apologize to the Muslim. We don't have to apologize to the Buddhist. We don't have to uh, apologize to the New Ager or even the, 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 the morally uh, uh, right uh, uh, atheist. We don't have to apologize for who we are. And so when they say, listen, I know you're a Christian, but if you ever look into something else... Well, why would I look into something else? You, you see what I'm saying? So it, just, it doesn't invalidate the truth just because I'm not dabbling in, in transcendental mes uh, meditation. It doesn't invalidate my experience with Christ Jesus just because I, I'm not uh, 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 going and pondering maybe uh, some Eastern religion. No, what validates it is the fact that we have a God that died on the cross and rose again on the third day and they couldn't find His body. Why? Because He's alive. Right. And so we can't agree to disagree on those issues. There's certain things that we've got to stand pat on. So he said, I wanted to make sure that they were in agreement, no disagreement. Paul saw this as essential, really with the same premise, uh, uh, regardless if you're ministering to Jews or Gentile, that there could not be some underlying difference that would eventually make its way to the surface and undermine the gospel itself. You know what Amos 3.3 says is what? How can two people walk together except they be in agreement? And so I can't disagree, agree to disagree and be in agreement or walk the way that he's walking. And so agreement literally means to be assembled together. It means to be betrothed as unto a wife. To become one. So how can two really walk together to get anywhere except they be in agreement? Remember as kids and we get in those, uh, they have the, like the competitions at school on the last day of school. I don't know if your school ever did this. And you do what? What was that race you ran with somebody else? It's a three-legged race. And there were certain people you wanted to be teamed up with, and there were certain people you never wanted to be teamed up with. And she's pointing at her friend over here. And so you wanted somebody that you knew could run and lock step with you. Try running a, a, a three-legged race with someone that's not coordinated. Where are you going to get? You're not going to get anywhere. You're going to fall on your face, and you say, well, I wish I would have had someone else. Folks, well, listen, the gospel's the exact same way. The only way we're going to advance in the kingdom is through walking in agreement with the truth. How can two walk together except they be in agreement? Otherwise, at best, you're like a dog chasing its own tail. There's a lot of effort. There's a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of sincerity. But you're just going around in, in, in circles. And so you've got to be betrothed as unto a wife. You've got to become one or become unified is what he's talking about in Amos 3.3. And that's the whole point of the, the Galatian letter. Is listen, we've got to come into agreement. I want to go and I want to make sure that we're in agreement because there's too much at stake. I want to make sure that we're in agreement because if we're not in agreement now and we just pacify one another, so we think, listen, we're just going to uh, agree to disagree. What do you think eventually is going to happen? Those disagreements are going to come to the surface. You can't hold those things now. Be like somebody says, listen, I'm going to just hold out for a little while because they'll eventually come, come around to my side. Have you ever said that in a situation? Mm -hmm. What ended up happening? They didn't Nothing. come around to your side. Discord ended up happening. Division came. Why? Because it was never uh, founded on the solid rock of agreement or being betrothed to one another. And the reason behind that, that he said we got to be in agreement, is what he says in verse 3. Look what he said. He says, and they supported me. He said, we're going to get in agreement, and they supported me. I have these conversations with people about what support is. It's interesting I have them in light of what we're teaching here tonight, but to support something means to undergird something. You know what undergirding is? How do I undergird the foundation of a house? Work. Huh? Work. 
I work? Well, I better work to do this. <laughs> Has anybody heard of rebar? Yes. What does rebar do in a, in a concrete foundation? It strengthens the cement. It undergirds. It holds everything. Have you ever heard of a steel girder? What's a steel girder? <laughs> well, you may not ever see a steel girder, but you're glad the steel girder is in that 50-story building that you go up. Uh, so something that undergird provides uh, the, strong, the strength to the skeleton. It provides the very basis of everything. So if I'm walking in support of something, it means I'm undergirding it. It means that I have a firm foundation. So support is that which is committed to bear the weight of that which is built upon top of it. And so if I have rebar, it's committed to, build, to, to, to be the strength that's going to bear the weight. And so I can't have support unless I have agreement. And so Paul the Apostle said, listen, we're going, I want to make sure that they agree because I need their support. I don't need the wheels to fall off of this, 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 this effort to evangelize the, the, the Gentiles and extend the covenant that God made with Abraham, the wheels to fall off later, because you guys said, listen, let's just let Paul do his own thing. Those are just a bunch of heathens. Those are just a bunch of Gentiles. Let's just get them interested in, 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 in the Judeo-Christian faith. Then later on, we'll reel them in. See, Paul the Apostle realized that there would be a problem with that. And so what he do? He said, listen, I want to go. I want to share with them exactly the principles of the gospel that have been revealed to me. That way, at the end of the day, they don't say, listen, I really wasn't in agreement with you. I was just hoping you'd come along to my side. Or I really wasn't uh, genuinely supportive of you. I just wanted to pacify you in the hopes that one day you would come, to, uh, uh, come into agreement with me. And so you can't genuinely support that which you disagree with. Right? I had a conversation with... Uh, my lovely daughter over here, Johanna, Josephine, and we was just talking about supporting things. And, and the, the situation was, she said, well, such and such supports me. I said, well, they disagree with what you're doing. She said, yeah, but they're still supportive of whatever I do. I said, well, that's just nice rhetoric, but there's no foundation for that in the Word of God. You genuinely cannot support that which you disagree with because when the weight becomes too heavy or tedious to bear, you'll be inclined to remove yourself from that foundational support. That's what you'll do. You'll say, well, I support you. Folks, think about Christianity today. Christianity, unfortunately, it's not built upon a, a, a mutual agreement with the things of God. It's, it's, it's become so politicized. So if you have somebody in the church that's been in the church for a, 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 a long period of time, how do they tell the pastor that they no longer support what he's doing? What's the first thing they typically do? Stop. They stop giving. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to pull the plug on my giving even though their giving is not uh, in, 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 in obedience to the pastor, their giving is obedience to the word. Mm -hmm. And so I don't agree with you. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to disobey God's word to show you that I disagree with you. Then mm -hmm. once they pull the plug on their financial support, then what happens? They, they pull the plug on their faithfulness to attend or to, to support the services or whatever else. So you can always see when there's a disagreement. The first thing they do, let's hit the pocketbook. Then we're going to hit the attendance. They don't hit the attendance first. Why? Because they want to be there so you can look them in the face like Brandon was talking about so you can just see how much they're in disagreement with you. They want you to have to, to preach into that sour face every single week or that frown. That way you know, and you know that person is giving that sour look. Folks, we've all been in the church for long enough that we know that's true. Then later on they're going to say, listen, uh, I guess you noticed that uh, I'm not giving to the church anymore. Uh, well, I don't notice because I don't take anything from you anyway. Amen. <laughs> and so, but you see how that, that works. And so when they stop supporting the work, what they or stop agreeing with the work, they stop being that foundational support. So Paul wanted to make it very important in regards to ministry relationships that it's indispensable in the new covenant to ever dispense from having that solid foundation, which is the word of God. He wanted to say, listen, it can't be you guys are doing something in Jerusalem and we're doing something in Galatia, or you guys are doing something in, in Jerusalem and we're doing something in the uttermost parts of the world. We've got to come into agreement because there's only one way, there's only one truth, and there's only one life. If we begin to fragment the body, we cease to undergird it with a general agreement on those principles, then what's going to happen? So in relationships or ministry or ministry activities, you know what, folks? You can get by and even succeed when you disagree. Okay? Dot, dot, dot. You can get by and you, be, you can even succeed when you disagree, but not actively oppose because many of those situations that we disagree with, they fall under the title of non-essentials so, or, or methods, and they're not sacred things. So we don't have to agree on everything. That's not even what we're talking about when it says, how can two walk together except they be in agreement? Take, for instance, street ministry. 
Now, we have a method of street ministry or evangelism that we do. Our method is we've got this gigantic red duct tape cross and we stand up in the middle of the street with this big gaudy sign that says Raven Street Church. We're out there and people say, well, isn't that a little bit too much? Well, it's probably not enough. It's very gaudy. It's, 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 it's meant to draw attention. We get out there with a very loud sound system. We elevate people about a foot and a half off the ground. We want to make sure that we're not missed, okay? That's a method. Now, if somebody comes along and they don't feel uh, uh, comfortable doing that and they're talking to someone and they're giving the same message, I'm totally fine with that. I just know the message that God had given me, the method that God has, has spoken to my heart to use. And so somebody can say, listen, man, that's really not for me. I'm thinking, well, praise God. You know what? There's tons of people that are lost up on Canal Street walking by. Go preach the same message to them. Or there's people at the grocery store. Use that same message. So when I'm talking about an agreement, somebody doesn't have to say, Raven Street Church, uh, Friday and Saturday night, standing at the 500 block of Bourbon Street, boldly proclaiming the, the Word of God and, and, and witnessing one-on-one. -on -one. That's the only way you can do it. Folks, listen, are we really that arrogant to think that's the only way you can do it? There's, that's, there's only one Bourbon Street. There's only one 15-foot red cross, except on the night that we <laughs> on the cross out there. But listen, folks, there's been people saved in all kinds of, in, in nursing homes and in, in, in schoolhouses. There are people that saved everywhere. So that's not what we have to be agreement on. So because those things, the method is not sacred. So those non-sacred things, folks, listen, whatever your personality is, whatever your strength is, if God's given you some ingenuity in the area, man, utilize that. They don't do the same thing on Sunday mornings underneath the, uh, underneath the bus stop. They don't do the same things on adoptive block. They don't do that. But the message is what is sacred. That's what we've got to be agree, uh, in agreement with. And that's what Paul was trying to, to really drive that point home. Listen, we can't be in a disagreement over the essentials of the message. How you incorporate that message here in Jerusalem may be different than the way we're doing it in Antioch or someplace else in Galatia. But the central message has got to be the, the exact same. That's what we have to have agreement otherwise. What about worship music? Been to churches that lack the old hymns? No, I like to sing an old hymn every once in a while. I like to sing contemporary. Sometimes I get tired of the old hymns. Sometimes I get tired of the contemporary. As long as the focus of my worship is upon God and the, there's a clear message in that worship, hey, knock yourself out. And if you like to, to spit a little rap out and do it, hey, more power to you. If you like the 2-4 beat or the 1-3, the, 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 the if you like a black gospel, whatever it is, more power to you. Just make sure that your focus is always upon God and the message of your worship is consistent with the Scripture. And so those aren't the things we have to be in agreement with because He desires what? True worshipers, those that worship Him in a hymnal or those that worship Him in contemporary Christian or black gospel, no, those that worship Him in spirit and in truth. The, that's what we have to get in agreement with. And so all of those things that we do that we that we are non-essential, folks, listen, you, you don't have to be in agreement with those things. But we have to be in agreement with those things that are essential for the for the gospel. So, for instance, uh, uh, such as this, as this, he's, if I disagree with the effectiveness of the message, but I still participate because of the unity associated with the message, that's okay. I'll say that again. I may disagree with the effectiveness of the method, but I can still participate because of the unity associated with the message. And so if somebody tells me, listen, the only way you can do that is to stand uh, and wait for somebody to come up to you and ask for a conversation. Well, as long as they're waiting and they have the right conversation, then I can, I can associate with that. Okay, dude, let's do that. If that works where you're at and you don't want me open air preaching, man, I'm going to walk in agreement with you and maybe we'll just wait and maybe we won't catch as many fish as I think we should do. But listen, your heart's right. Your message is right. You're on point with that stuff. Hey, I'll, I'll do whatever you need me to do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be all things to all men that by all means, I can win some. And so we've got to always focus on those things that are important and make the main thing the main thing. But my participation will never be equal to that that I do not support. Participation can occur where there's mere tolerance, but support requires an equal commitment to last. And so if I'm genuinely going to participate in somewhere, in, in, in something over time, it requires that I am in agreement with it on a commitment level. Otherwise, I'm only going to participate to the degree that it meets my need rather than meets the need of the kingdom. And so we can't just be good starters and say that I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to participate in something and never be a good finisher. Why? Because somewhere along the lines, we're going to draw that line, and that line is going to be a line of disagreement. We're going to say, well, the reason I'm not continuing that is because I disagree. Well, some things you can do that on. Other things, like the premise of salvation and the continuance of the gospel, 
Those are things that we can't part ways on. So the issue that he was talking about here in Galatians, once again, it was that ceremonial circumcision that he talked about. But it was one of those issues that demanded support and not mere tolerance because it was vital to the understanding of the, new, of the genuine nature of the new covenant. And so Paul the Apostle said, listen, this isn't something we can gloss over. This isn't something that can be the, the Jerusalem version of salvation versus the Galatian version of salvation. And so he said, listen, this is one of those things that demands you stand in agreement with us. So then, verse 4, it says, even that question came up only because some of the so-called Christians there were false ones. It said, really, they, they were secretly brought in. And it says, and they sneaked in. This is Galatians chapter 2. And it says, and they sneaked in to spy on us to take away the freedom we have in Christ Jesus. Why'd they come? To take away the freedom. Now, let me ask you a question. You've been reading Galatians, and many of you have read it many times. It's that first chapter. Do you see anything that's, that's in your face designed to take away your freedom? This is your face. I mean, these are good people. You know, these were religious people. I mean, these weren't people that were wanting to invite them out to the bear joint. These weren't people that are telling them to get involved in sexual immorality. They weren't doing that, were they? Those weren't people that were, were saying to them, listen, you've got to serve false gods or you've got to uh, uh, make some sacrifice for Molech. They, I mean, that's not what we're talking about. But he said they were there to take away the freedom that we have in Christ. Because look what, they, look what it says. It goes on to say there in verse, the end of verse 4. It says they wanted to enslave us and force us to follow their religious regulations, their Jewish regulations. It says, but we refused to give in to them for a single moment. For how long? Single moment. For a single moment, he said, we wanted to preserve the truth of the gospel message for you. So here's my question tonight. When he speaks of taking away the freedom that we have in Christ, what do you think he's referring to? What do you think he's referring to? Anybody? The liberty to share. Freedom from the law. Freedom from the law. Now, do you ever think to yourself that, man, is there really any bondage in that? Well, absolutely worse. So what did Jesus come to set us free from? Came to set us free. The spirit of the life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin. The wages of sin is death. And so if I'm under the law, I'm under the law of sin and death. Think about Romans chapter 6. I'll start with verse 1. I'm going to jump around just a little bit. Let's go back to that freedom. He said, well then, should we keep on sinning? Paul the Apostle was the same one that, that, that penned this epistle to the Galatians in the Roman letter, Romans 6, he said, well then, should we keep on sinning that God can show us more and more of His wonderful grace? Well, of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ, Jesus, in baptism, we were joined unto His death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism, and just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may have new lives. And look at verse 5. Since we have now been united, there's that word agreement, since we've come into agreement with Him in His death, we will also be saved uh, to the life that He was. So, where do we come into agreement? Yeah. At the cross. That was the death of Christ. And so where I come into agreement is, is not with some ceremonial circumcision. It's not with religious acts. Where I come into agreement with Christ is at the cross. And so we, we come into agreement with Him. We're united to Him in His death. What did He say up on the cross? It is... Finished. We're united with Him. We, we get into Galatians 2.20 one day that I've been crucified with Him. Nevertheless, I live. You know the rest of the verse. He said, because I'm united with Him in His death, I'm in agreement. That's where I'm undergirded. We will also be raised to life as He was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We're no longer slaves to sin. Then verse 7 of Romans 6, underline this, circle it, highlight it, memorize it. This is the power. For when we died with Christ, when we came into agreement with the cross, we were set free from the power of sin. Folks, listen. Without a revelation of Christ, without everything about your walk with Christ being undergirded through the finished work of the cross of Calvary, folks, you'll never be set free from the power of sin. And so if you have a struggle, an ongoing struggle with sin in your life, you need to get back to the cross. You don't need to get back to, 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 to some religious act. You don't need to save myself if I just memorize enough passages or I attend enough services or I do enough good works, I'll have freedom. 
What's that do? That just creates another bondage on you that just pushes down and just causes you to say, listen, I'm agree or disagree. And so I'm going to busy myself with all this righteous, these righteous things, but man, there's, there's still something inside of me that's in agreement with the profession of my mouth. There's something that's not right about the inside. And so when we come into agreement, when we're in, in united with Him at the cross, then we're set free from the power of sin. Why? Because why did Jesus come? To set us free from sin. That we might be free. Now look what He goes on to say in verse uh, 12. He said, Do not let sin control the way that you live. How can I not let sin control the way that I live? I get in agreement. I unite with Him in His death. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, somebody say instead, instead. give yourselves completely to God for you were dead, but now you have a new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Sin is no longer your master. When? When I'm in agreement with Christ. When I'm in agreement with the finished work of the cross. Sin is no longer, uh, 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 it's no longer your master. He said for you were dead. He said, instead, give yourself complete to God, for you were dead, but now you're alive in Christ. Use your whole body as an instrument to God. He said, sin is no longer your master, verse 14, for you no longer live under the requirements of the law, which was, one of the requirements was circumcision. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. I'll read verse 15. He said, well then, he said, since God's grace has set us free from the law, does that mean that we can go on sinning? He repeated what he said in 6.1. Of course not. Then jump down to verse 20 of, of Romans 6. He said, when you were slaves to sin, what's another way of saying a slave to sin? What's the modern version of that? Bound by sin. Huh? Bound by sin. What about Lost. just the old sinner saved by grace? Well, if I'm saved from something, that means I'm no longer a captive of something. It'd be like a lifeguard sitting out there on the beach on a big tower and somebody waving their arms and him calling out to them and saying, what's the matter? Well, I'm drowning. And he says, you're saved. He goes back to read this book. So why is he still in the water? What were you saving him from? You were saving him from the water, so why is he still in it? And so when we make statements like, I'm just a sinner saved from grace, so why are you still in sin and not in grace? Does that make sense? If I'm a sinner saved by grace, why am I still in sin and not in grace? Grace being that divine influence of God upon my heart. So why is it that everything about my life, my commitment is to sin who I'm saved from rather than grace. So we get this weird spiritual Stockholm Syndrome. You know what Stockholm Syndrome is? Mm -hmm. what, what was it? Isn't that when you are like you're kidnapped or something and you start like... And you're held in captivity for a long time and you've developed a loyalty to your captor. Yeah. I mean, they would abuse you. They would hold you against your will. But you, you, you feel sorry for the person that held you in captivity. And so what's happened over the years and what happened even under the law and what's happened since then under a false gospel is we've created this spiritual Stockholm Syndrome and we feel sorry for sin. Well, I don't want to, I don't want to walk away from sin because man, this sin will be lonely. So I'm just no, I'm still, I'm still this little sinner. I'm just this, and, and we feel sorry for, for a lost world that is the enemy of God. And so we want to relate to them. I, I know you're a sinner. I know you're going to hell. But I want to relate to you and sing kumbaya to you. We get this spiritual Stockholm Central rather than the Word telling us to come out from among who? Them? Them who? Those that are still under the bondage and the, the consequence of sin. Come out from among them and be separate. Don't even touch the unclean thing and then I will receive you. Come out from among them and I'll receive you. Don't just agree to disagree. And think that you can have fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. He says, don't do it, but rather reprove them. Stand against those things. What fellowship does light have with darkness? None. And so what we want to do, though, is we want to agree to disagree. We want to uh, not major on the majors, but we want to major on the minors and say, well, listen, you've got to love them. Well, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Any man that loves the world has that spiritual Stockholm Syndrome. The love of the Father is not inside of them. And so you can see it wasn't just something that was injected into the, the, the early church in Galatia. But folks, it's something that's alive and well and it's like, uh, like that seven-headed monster that just keeps presenting itself in different uh, variations. It's like, man, how did I do that? And my intentions were right. Well, folks, probably the Judaizers who were raised up under the law, maybe their intentions were right. But they just cut their teeth on the law and so their identity was in the law just like some of us get our identity from our old man. How do I know that? Well, 
as far as many people's walk with the Lord goes, it's just the testimony of how rotten they were. You know? Well, show me, show me with your testimony. Well, they spent 30 minutes talking about how rotten they were and about two minutes talking about how good God was. You, you know what I'm saying? Oh, man, that guy's got a good testimony. Really? What was it? Man, he was a drunk. He was a fiend. He was a, movie, uh, a womanizer. Well, they said he had a good testimony. That's a horrible testimony. That's why he had to get saved. <laughs> <laughs> you see how upside down this world of those who call good evil and evil good who put sweet for bitter and bitter for sweet folks that's what we've, what we've invited in to the modern church and so we think the tremendous testimony is somebody being rotten and coming to Jesus rather than somebody just coming to Jesus and Jesus being good in their life well tell me about how good God is Folks, I've known so many people that have fallen into the trap and don't even walk with the Lord because they were trying to build a testimony on sin rather than build a testimony on the finished work of the cross of Calvary. I hear it. And it's like, I'm thinking, okay, Lord, don't send somebody else into me that's going to say that. But I hear it all the time. I want to have a testimony built upon the rottenness of my flesh rather than the foundation of who Jesus Christ is. So, verse 15 again, you've been set free. Great God's grace. Well then, since God's grace has set you free from the law, does that mean we can go on sin? Of course not. Verse 20, when you were slaves to sin, you were free from the obligation to do right. In other words, when you were uh, devoted to sin, you, you were free from that obligation. Folks, listen. As believers, we're obligated to do right. We're not put into a situation where we agree to disagree. Then there's an obligation inside of us to always do what's right. I'm obligated. It's, it's not over and above the call of duty. It's not Rambo Christianity it's, I'm in walking in lockstep and I'm undergirded with the truth and so I'm obligated to do right. I'm obligated to obey. I'm obligated to walk in the joy of the Lord. I'm obligated to walk in faith. I'm obligated to forgive. I'm obligated to be holy. I'm obligated. There's an obligation that comes through that relationship. Why? Because I'm betrothed to Jesus. And so just like I would, I'm, I'm obligated to have fidelity towards my spouse in a marital relationship, I'm also obligated to have fidelity towards Jesus because I'm the bride of Christ. And so if I depart from that, what have I done? I've experienced spiritual whoremongering and I've devoted myself to someone else and I have a mistress and Jesus Christ is just that one-time lover or that, 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 that person I call upon when I really need somebody to, to, to occupy my time. But I'm never going to be undergirded in victory unless I come to that place. So that was the result. He said, you're obligated to do right. Verse 21 of Romans 6. And what was the result? You're now ashamed of the things that you used to do. That's the end of eternal doom. Folks, the problem with many people is they're not ashamed of what they used to do. They boast in what they used to do. They boast in their sin. They boast in their rottenness. Folks, you need to be so transformed that the only testimony you have is the cross of Calvary. Not that I was a thug and I was a killer and I was a top drug dealer in Miami and I was, you know, I was all these other things. But I want a testimony that's so huge that, that that distant past that I was is not even a faint echo in my life. Well, who'd you used to be? You know what? I don't even remember. That person's been dead so long. I couldn't even tell you anything about him. Those books have been closed. My sins have been blotted out. God don't remember it, so why would I remember it? I'm crucified with Christ. Folks, that should be the testimony of the church. Rather than, 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 than glorifying our rottenness, we ought to glorify God in our lives. And that was, and, but now you are free from the power of sin and you become slaves of God. You are what? Free from the power of, slave, of sin and you're slaves of God. Now you do those things that lead to holiness and the results of life. So, folks, listen. The freedom that these Judaizers in Galatia and really those attending uh, uh, Paul's meeting in Jerusalem what they were doing, they were attempting to eradicate from the gospel message was by requiring adherence to that law, which was physical circumcision, which I, I said, uh, surprisingly, that's, that's still going on today. And so what they wanted to do, they wanted to eliminate the freedom, the ability to really genuinely walk in victory by injecting physical circumcision into the equation. And again, we do the exact same thing. How do you get victory? Uh, what can we inject into the equation? Well, you'll have victory if you go to church enough. <laughs> All this stuff sounds good, doesn't it? You'll, you'll have victory if you pray two hours a day. You'll have victory if you read enough Bible verses. You'll read enough. You'll have victory if you in the right church. You'll have victory if you're in the right discipleship group. You'll have victory if you're a faithful giver. Now, the reason that we kind of shudder when we hear stuff like this is, well, don't we need to pray? Don't we need to read the Bible? Don't we need to do these things? Well, all of those things we don't do to have acceptance. We do those things out of our love for Him. Man, I want to be in fellowship. I don't want to forsake the assembling of myself together, which is the custom of the Son. But I want to draw near, even as I see that day approach. I want to do that because I love the brethren. I, 
I, I want to read the word, not because I'm thinking I'm going to get brownie points. If I can, oh, if I can check off and, and, and read enough passages in the day and I can uh, re recite enough, enough King James vernacular or whatever else, then God's going to love me and I'm going to be real cool. Or, or, I'm, or God's going to love me. I'm, if I can make sure I go to the streets every single week and, and, uh, and I've got enough pictures on Facebook of me preaching the gospel, then God's going to say, man, look what a lad, that a boy. Folks, I don't do those things to get God to love me. I, I do those things because God loves me and I love Him and I want to make His love known. And so I don't walk in the condemnation of thinking if I don't dot the right uh, I and cross the right T, then somehow I'm going to fail God. Folks, listen. I failed God. Do you hear me? I failed God from the beginning and so I had to cast off failure in all my own efforts and come to the foot of the cross and put my faith in Him and not take it back. Do you hear what I'm saying? I had to not take it back. Think about what they said to Jesus. Come down from the cross and save yourself. Folks, we do that all the time. Well, not through physical belief in a physical circumcision that's going to make us righteous, but don't we come down from the cross, that place that undergirds us, and we try to save ourselves, if I can do enough things or act a certain way or whatever else, and save ourselves? Folks, if we could have saved ourselves apart from faith when we finished working the cross, why would we ever try anything else? Folks, we can't do that. We've got to always come back. That's why you see this ebb and flow of people that, oh, I'm, 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 I'm really radical for Christ, and all of a sudden where I'm at. I'm really uh, hot for Jesus, and all of a sudden I'm not. I'm really dedicated, then I'm not. Well, it shows you where you put your, your strength and you put your foundation. Well, you just kind of agree to disagree, and all of a sudden all that stuff rises back to the surface, and you have to look at it again. Why? Because it was never crucified. It was pacified. See, I'm not pacified by Christ. I'm crucified with Christ. I'm not just putting off those things and trying to hold those things in check long enough that one day maybe I'll have victory. Amen. No, I just come to the end of myself. Say, God, I'm done with Troy. I'm done with me. I'm done with all of those things that I identified who, my, who I was, what I desired, what I wanted, all of those things, and I've just come into agreement that, listen, I'm dead. I'm dead in your life. And so the freedom that they want was that attempt to eradicate the gospel by requiring that adherence and, but the freedom from sin. So what happened, the Jews desired to implement just a little leaven of the law into the equation so that they could keep the door open for later. And so let me ask you a question. Do you think that they would have just been satisfied with the Gentiles just merely being physically circumcised and left it at that? What if Paul would say, hey, listen, I guess that's not too bad. You know what? So they're going to remove a little foreskin, you know, on the eighth day. Just going to do that. I'll tell you what. I'll concede that that's okay, that they need to do that. Do you think they would have stopped there? What do you think would have happened next? Diet, yeah. They had the dietary laws? Well, put up them pork skins, buddy. You know, No more hot dogs for you. They had to, they said, listen, you know what? What would it hurt for them to celebrate the, 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 the Feast of Trumpets? Or Rosh Hashanah? Is it really going to hurt for them to, 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 to keep the, 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 the Sabbath? I know Sabbath wasn't Man wasn't made for the Sabbath, but Sabbath for the man. But you know what? Would it, would it really be that much of a stretch to make them recognize the Sabbath from Friday at 6 to, or sundown to, to, to Saturday at sundown? That wouldn't be too much. Hand Folks, washing. Listen, hand washing, ceremony, hand washing, all these other They would have never been satisfied. And what would have happened? Bit by bit, little by little, they'd have begun to bring that little bit of leaven back into it. And so how long do you think it would have been before they attempted to really just introduce more and more bondage of the law back into the equation? It would have happened. Once I'm in agreement with those things that destroy me, it's going to open up. Jesus said in, uh, in Mark 8.22 to his disciples, he said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Beware the leaven of these religious people. He also, uh, I think he really clarified it in Matthew 5.20. He said this, but I warn you, he said, unless your righteousness is better than that of the righteousness of the teachers of religious law, the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Your righteousness has got to be built and predicated upon something that, that will undergird your whole life. Not just undergird your religious experience. There's got to be something bigger than you, bigger than what you do. It's got to be what Jesus Christ did. And this was critical because verse 117 says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Folks, you know what's interesting about that? Law and grace came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Look at the contrast there. So I'm just thinking of that. What came by Moses? Law and grace. Law and grace. Excuse me. What came by law came by Moses. 
but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So Moses gave us what? Law, right? Jesus gave us grace and truth. It didn't say Moses gave us law coupled with grace and truth. It just said he gave us law, right? And what does the letter of the law do? It kills. It doesn't give life. Why does the letter of the law kill? Because that's what it was designed to do. It's called the law of sin and kill. I want to expose sin. I want you to reveal just how dead that you are. But grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So the law provided for circumcision, but could not provide for law and truth, for, for grace and truth. It provided for circumcision, which they wanted. And so they wanted to adhere to the, those, those principles of law, but it could not provide for grace and truth. Look, look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 16. I think you're going to really love this in regards to those first 10 verses of uh, chapter 2 in Galatians. Ephesians chapter 2, one, one book over there, one pencil over there. Ephesians 2, I'm going to read 8 through 16. He says, But God saved you by His grace when you believed. And where does grace and truth come from? Jesus Christ. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift of God. Salvation is not a reward for good things that we've done. Uh, if you King James says, We're saved by grace through faith, not a work that any man should boast. So none of us can boast about it, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. We're not saved by great things. Salvation is not the reward of those things, but we're created to do those things. And look at verse 11. He said, don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. He said, you were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. So they were so proud of something because they could go around and say, listen, I was circumcised, I was circumcised, but my heart's still wicked and I rejected the Messiah. He said, in those days you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship, citizenship among the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant promise that God had made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope, and now you've been united. There's that word again. I'm united with Him. I'm in agreement. He went so we could be united together. That's why Paul went to uh, uh, the church of Jerusalem. We're united with Christ. Once you were far away from God, but now you've been brought near to Him. There's that unity. Through what? The blood of Christ. Not through the blood of man. Not through ceremonial washings. Not through circumcisions. For Christ Himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one when we got circumcised together? No. In His own body on the cross, He broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. And He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating Himself one new people from two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of His death on the cross and our hostility towards each other was put to death. And so the unity that comes to us isn't because we all get together and we're going to re, uh, uh, revisit our Hebrew roots. The unity that comes to the Jew and to the Gentile is the same thing. It's the cross. Why? Because the Old Covenant pointed to the cross. The New Covenant points to the cross. There's a starting point for every single relationship with God, whether you're Jew, Gentile, or, or some other persuasion that you call yourself, and it's always got to become the cross of Calvary. So go back to Galatians chapter uh, 2, verse 6. And he said, The leaders of the church had nothing to do, to, nothing to add to what I was preaching. Uh, by the way, the reputation of great leaders it didn't make any difference to me, for God has no favorites, Paul interjected. He said, Instead, in verse 7, they saw that God had given me the responsibility of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, just as he had given Peter the responsibility of preaching it to the Jews. For the same God who worked through Peter as apostle to the Jews was also working through me as an apostle to the Gentiles. Verse 9. In fact, James, Peter, and John, who were known as pillars of church, recognized the gift that God had given me, and they accepted Barnabas and me as their co-laborers. They encouraged us to keep preaching the, to the Gentiles. What? Keep preaching what? Keep preaching the same message that we came to make sure they were in agreement. That way there wouldn't be any discord. While they continued their work with the Jews. Their only suggestion was that we keep on helping the poor, and we've always been eager to do that anyway. So the covenant of circumcision... Folks, when we look at it, why was it important to them under the law? Because under the law, it was a type of sanctification. That's what it was. They got sanctified. Uh, God said to Abraham, this is in Genesis 17, 1. He said, walk before me and you will be perfect. How many perfect people we have in here tonight? Just that. Two of us. Three of us. Why can I say that? I can say that because I'm not under the law. I can be perfect. Why? Because through one sacrifice the cross he has perfected forever those that are sanctified right 
So through one sacrifice, he's perfected forever those that are sanctified. John 17, 17 says what? Sanctify me by your truth. Your word. Thy word is truth. And so when I come back to the word, and I just believe what he said and what he did, and what's the truth? Jesus is the way, the truth. The truth. He's the life. No one comes to the Father. No one comes to a place of sanctification because you're not going to be in the presence of the Father unholy. So who's going to ascend to the hill of the Lord? Those with the pure, pure uh, clean hands and a pure heart. And so I'm sanctified if I make it to heaven. How do I get sanctified? It's not by ceremonial washing. It's not through circumcision, obviously. It's through faith in the finished work of the cross. He told, he told God told Abraham that, that he would establish a covenant with him. Look what he said in Genesis 17.10. He said, This is my covenant under the law, which you shall keep between me and you and your seed. After you, every man, child among you, shall be physically circumcised. So under the law, the reason it was important to them because it was an outward sign of an inward sanctification. And so God's covenant with Abraham concerning uh, circumcision, it was instituted at that time. Why? Because the cross had not yet happened. And so they only did that looking forward to what Jesus would do. They didn't do that as a, as a, as a, as a, 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 a something to, to be an end all. They did that just strictly to stand in the gap. The same way on the Day of Atonement. What would they do? They'd kill a lamb. And the high priest would go in twice. He'd go in for his own sins. And he'd sprinkle blood upon the mercy seat. Then he'd go in and he would offer that same sacrifice upon the mercy seat for the sins of the people. Just as a sign. Looking forward to the cross of Calvary. And so once Jesus Christ came, what happened? He came not to do away with the law or to say that it didn't have a purpose, but that the law might be fulfilled through him. Not through him plus circumcision, not through Him plus some other religious acts, but through Him. And what does that make me? That sanctifies me. It sets me apart for His service. No longer am I identified with the things of the world, but I'm identified with Christ Jesus. So the Jewish child was circumcised on the eighth day. Why do you think he was circumcised on the eighth day? Because they said, they showed now that God was so perfect that the health reasons, that's the only way they can be affected. Well, that's what they say now. Why do you really think he was... They didn't know that. They didn't... They were doctors. <laughs> I know we say that stuff. I mean, people say, well, that really makes sense because that's the, their, their immunity is the highest on the eighth day. I mean, I've heard this. It's because they're blood clots or something huh? like that. Well, because it's the day after God rested. Okay. You look at all these notes. So God created man. On the seventh day, he rested. But on the next day, well, that's when the work started. And so they were birthed so to speak, on the eighth day into that covenant relationship. And so man fell in the garden. After the rest, God brought them back into covenant. So it was a covenant thing. As much as it was, it made sense physically, obviously, because of just what uh, Vinny said from a, from a medical practitioner standpoint. <laughs> but they got circumcised on the eighth day because that was the first day of their life under the new covenant. And so he utilized just the, that same, those same numbering system. And so there would be no delay after the new birth for one to seek sanctification. And so they are not going to have the chance to be deluded or, 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 or the sanctification process evaded. But that new convert should, should undergird himself immediately in sanctification. And so it's the same thing under grace. We shouldn't tell a new believer, listen, you're going to mess up all the time. You hear people say that all the time. Well, you're just a baby Christ. You're going to foul up all the time. Well, why not? Now that you're saved, you're going to have victory all the time. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you rather fight from victory rather than fight from defeat? Mm -hmm. right. Now, you got saved. You can say no now. While you were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly, but you're not that anymore. Right. Now you are a slave to righteousness, and you're going to have the power to overcome. But what happens is we've diluted the gospel from the crimson blood to a pastel pink to make it easier to swallow. And we've told people, listen, you're, you're, I know you're saved. I know you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. I know old things are passed away. All things are become new. But he really didn't mean that. What he really meant is you're probably going to be the same struggling, founded person you've always been because the blood of Jesus, you know what? It covered some distant sin and all this stuff and it's more rhetorical and it's more, it, it, it's just more of a, a, token, a token sign of something, but it really doesn't have any power. I mean, we won't say it like that, but isn't that the message that's conveyed? You're always going to fail. You're always going to foul up. Maybe one day you'll figure it out. Maybe one day you'll get a religious enough like me and you'll be able to push down your sin. You know what they're saying? Because what am I sanctified by? Am I sanctified by my own works of righteousness? Or am I sanctified by the Word because God's Word is truth and when truth came alive inside of me, it should change something. But we've, we've been infiltrated by a, 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 a 2016 Judaizer that's brought a message of defeat 
rather than a message of victory. So folks, what we've got to do is we've got to come and we've got to get back in agreement and get undergirded by the truth rather than get uh, subverted by unrighteousness. Look what Paul said in Romans 4.11. He said, and he received a sign of circumcision. This is still talking about the covenant God made with Abraham. Romans 4.11. And he received a sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of faith, which he had not yet been, uh, which he, which he had, had yet been uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe. Though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. Then look at Romans 2, 28 and 29. He says, For he is not Jew, which is one outwardly, neither that of circumcision, speaking physically, which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and the circumcision is that of the heart. In other words, that righteousness, that covenant is affirmed in the heart. Sanctification in the spirit and not in the letter whose praise is not of man but of God. I'll give you a couple of related scriptures. I'm not going to turn to them but you can look at them later. Uh, look at the whole of Romans chapter 2 and 4 and look at Colossians 2.11 as well. But this is powerful. I've got to read something to you from Hebrews chapter 7 that I was looking at. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 11. Talking to... Uh, you understand historically... Why this letter? I, I believe it was Paul the Apostle, but whoever wrote it, I believe it was divinely given. Uh, whether it was Paul or, or some other writer, Luke or somebody, people said a plethora of people. But it was written because you had Jews that were coming to Christ who probably were being victimized by these same Judaizers, that same, that same men. And so you had these Jews that were coming to Christ, and you had these people on this side that were so adamant about following the law. Then you had the Roman citizenry that was saying, man, who are these Christians that are now uh, serving this, this other God, this one that, that we put to death. And so you had this group of people that were saying, listen, maybe I should just kind of act like a Jew. At least I'm on somebody, because I'm never going to act like a Roman. But maybe I can just kind of slide back in and can kind of do those things and be kind of a, an undercover brother. And so this letter was written to those people that were going undercover in their faith and acting like they were still under the law. And so we see things in, in Hebrews like, uh, uh, if, if you if you sin after you've come to knowledge of truth, there remains no more a sacrifice for your sins. Well, he uses those words sacrifice and things of that nature to, to, to align it back with what they were thinking in their mind. And so Hebrews 7, 11 through 19, speaking to those people that were very, very knowledgeable of the law, he said, so if the priesthood of Levi, on which the law was based, could have achieved the perfection of God, intended, why did God need to establish a different priesthood with a different priest under the order of Melchizedek instead of that under the order of Levi and Aaron. So he said, listen, if that if the law was based upon something that could have given you a perfection, it could have achieved the righteousness of God. So why did he establish a different priesthood under the order of Melchizedek instead of that order of Levi and Aaron? Now, Jesus is called the what? The Lion of the tribe of Judah. Where did under the law the priesthood come out of? Levi. It wasn't, it wasn't Judah. And so Jesus, as that high priest of the new covenant did not even come out of the right tribe. And so just by the very fact of him coming and being born in the tribe of Judah, he already broke from Jewish tradition. And so he's the priest after the order of Melchizedek. And it says in verse 12 of Hebrews 7, and if the priesthood is changed, the law must also be changed to permit it. So if the priesthood changed, the law's got to change. And so when you have Hebrew roots people, when you have uh, these, these groups that want to bring you back under the law, well, the problem is, is the law changed. Because the same law that, that changed and permitted Jesus to be from the tribe of Judah is the same law that changed that does not require all of those things of me. Because the feast and, and the, 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 the certain moons and the, 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 the certain dietary customs, those things were under the other order, under the, the Levitical priesthood. We're not under that priesthood. We're under that order, that priesthood after the order of Melchizedek, under the line of the tribe of Judah. And so when you're talking to those people that are bound, say, well, you keep holding that because those people don't have a Messiah. That tribe didn't produce it. Jesus was produced out of the tribe of Judah. So, so if that priesthood changed, he said, uh, verse 13, so the priest we are talking about now belongs to a different tribe whose members who have never served as altars of priests he said, what I mean is this, our Lord came from the tribe of Judah, and Moses never mentioned priests coming from that tribe. And so those that would want to bring you back into that bondage, even their own belief, even their own law, even their own standards, would have to admit that Moses never allowed for that to happen, but they'll allow for it to happen. Why? Because they still need this Jesus in the equation, but Jesus plus 
the law doesn't equal righteousness. Jesus puts the cross equals righteousness. Verse 15 says, This change, this change has been made very clear since a different priest who is like Melchizedek has appeared. Jesus became a priest not by meeting the physical requirements of belonging to the tribe of Levi, but by the power of a life that cannot be destroyed. And the psalmist pointed this out when he prophesied, You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Verse 18. Yes, the old requirement about the priesthood was set aside because it was weak and useless, for the law never made anything perfect. But now we have confidence in a better hope through which we draw near to God. And Romans 5.20 says, God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were, but as people sinned more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. So folks, listen. The law was never intended to show people freedom. The law was intended to show people bondage. Think about that. That's what it's for. And so when they begin to bring back this bondage of circumcision, they weren't showing people freedom. They were showing people bondage. It was so that people could see the futility of their efforts and somehow achieve righteousness apart from a God, apart from faith in the finished work of the cross of Calvary. So you can't say, well, you must be a good person to serve God. You must be an educated person. You must be a, a social activist. You must be a sincere person to serve God. <laughs> so who are you talking about? Are you a social activist? Oh, no. No, he said, you must be born again, not of circumcision, but by the Holy Spirit, grace through faith. And so Paul understood it in Romans 7. He said, there's another law within me. He said, that's at war within my mind. He said, this power makes me a slave to sin that is still within me. Folks, the law that Paul was talking about that made him a slave to sin was that Mosaic law that he understood. He was a slave to sin because of the law. But freedom came through his adherence to righteousness. So the reason that sin was still alive in him was because he had not yet accepted those things that could eradicate and not just simply uh, postulate sin in his life. And so for us, we, we've got to see sin removed from our life, not just come into agreement with sin, but come into righteousness. I'm going to close with this. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. He said, you know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be a very difficult time for people who love only themselves and their money They'll be boastful, proud, scoffing to God, disobedient to parents, ungrateful. They won't consider anything sacred. They will be unloving, unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. And then verse 5, it kind of departs from all of that wicked stuff that we're saying amen, amen to. And verse 5 says, they'll act religious, but they'll reject the power that can make them godly. Stay away from some people. See, the other ones we're, we're totally agreeing with. Yeah, unthankful, unholy, unrighteous, no self-control. But what about they'll act religious, but they'll reject the power that could make them God? Folks, that's faith in the finished work of the cross of Calvary. Well, they were religious. They were under the law. But he says, stay away from people like that. Father, we just thank you, Lord God. Father, I thank you for the cross, Lord God. Father, I thank you, Lord God, that it's not by my own works of righteousness, Lord God, because I never could have done enough things to satisfy the wrath that I deserve. But Lord God, I thank you for the great mercy of God that has extended to us. And Father, I just thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord God, just cause your word, Lord God, just to resonate in our hearts and spirit. Let us walk holy, Lord God, even as you are holy. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.